Okay, we'll start. Huh? Uh, good morning. Uh, today we'll have uh, two case discussions. Uh, one on parambolical hernia, one on uh, congenital hernia. So the case will be presented by Dr. Nitesh Pradhan, who is a second year uh, PG resident at MR Bangur Hospital. And Dr. Siddharth Shankar Mishra, who is a senior resident at MR Bangur. And myself will conduct the session. Okay, Nitesh, you can share your screen and present. Morning, sir. Today I'm going to uh, present a case uh, on parambilical hernia. My patient, Mr. Vasudev Haldar, 48 year gentleman, shopkeeper by occupation, resident of Zadokur, came with the chief complaint of swelling just above the umbilicus for the last one year. History of present illness a 48 year gentleman presented with swelling just above the umbilicus in the midline for one year. Initially, the swelling was approximately 1 cm, gradually progressing to a size of 3 cross 3 cm and was painless. The swelling decreases in size on lying down and increases on standing and activity. No history of chronic cough, constipation, no history of abdominal pain, vomiting, uh, abdominal distension, no urinary complaint. Past history, patient is known case of type 2 diabetic fetus on AHS since 10 years. No other comorbidity, no history of any previous surgery. Personal history is married and has two children, wife and all children are healthy, takes mixed diet, sleep and appetite normal, bowel and bladder normal, no history of any addiction. Family history, no similar, uh, no, his, no history similar, uh, no similar history in the family member. Treatment history, no history of any treatment, allergic history, no history of energy to food and drug. Summary, a 48 year gentleman presented with the swelling just above the umbilicus in the midline for one year. Initially, swelling was approximately 1 cm, gradually progressing to the present size of 3 cross 3 cm and was painless. The swelling decreases in size on lying down and increases on standing and activity, bowel and blood are, uh, are normal. Finish up the presentation. General survey are uh, essentially normal. Local examination on inspection approximately 3 plus 3 cm swelling uh, uh, 1 cm above the umbilicus in the midline. On palpation, the swelling was soft in consistency, size of approximately 3 cross 3.5 3. Uh, 3 3 cm swelling 1 cm above the umbilicus, which was reducible non tender. Expensive cough impulse was positive. Gap of approximately 2 cm is palpable. Temperature over the swelling was normal. Resonant mode on percussion. Uh, systemic examination are within the uh, normal limit. Summary, 48 year gentleman presented with swelling just above the umbilicus in the midline for one year. Initially, swelling was approximately 1 cm gradually producing. Uh, present size of 3 cross 3 cm was for painless. Swelling decreases in size on lying down and increase in on the standing and activity. Bowel and bladder uh, are normal. Uh, Activity normal on examination, general survey normal on local examination, uh, 3 into 3.5 centimeters swelling, 1 uh, centimeter above the umbilicus, the midline soft in consistency, reducible, non tender, cough impulse positive, and the gap of approximately 2 centimeters on palpation. Resonant node on percussion system examination is normal. My provisional, uh, provisional diagnosis this is a case of reducible parambilical hernia and 48 year gentleman, content is the Thank you. Okay, go back to the history present illness slide. Shita, you can start the discussion. Yes, sir. So, how do you justify your diagnosis based sir, on your history and examination? Uh, sir, uh, so, uh, sir, the patient came with a swelling uh, above the umbilicus, uh, which was uh, painless and uh, uh, on lying down, the swelling decreases, and on standing, uh, activity uh, on uh, on uh, and increases on activity or in standing position. Painless is immaterial. There may be many other painless swellings. Main thing is the swelling is around the umbilicus, and uh, it is um, increasing in size on straining and on examination. 
सर ऑन एग्जामिनेशन सर सर स्वेलिंग वाज रिड्यूसेबल एक्सपेंसिबल ऑफ इंपल्स वाज पॉजिटिव तो बेसिकली टू स्पेसिफिक कैरेक्टर्स ऑफ अ हर्निया वर प्रेजेंट एक्सपेंसिबल ऑफ इंपल्स एंड रिड्यूसेबल ओके व्हाई डू यू कॉल इट अ पारा अम्बिलिकल हर्निया नॉट अ अम्बिलिकल हर्निया सर एज पर एचएस गाइड क्लासिफिकेशन सर 3 cm above the umbilicus and below uh, 3 cm below the umbilicus uh, considered to be a paraumbilical hernia in adults and, 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 and in adults, the adults usually we don't see umbilical hernia what is an mean anatomically what is the difference between a paraumbilical hernia and a umbilical hernia uh, sir uh, anatomically sir uh, paraumbilical hernia the uh, the डिफेक्ट इज इन दिड लाइन ऑफ मिड लाइन कम्स आउट थ्रू द अम्बिलिकल डिफेक्ट डायरेक्टली थ्रू द अम्बिलिकल डिफेक्ट इट्स अम्बिलिकल हनिया इफ इट कम्स स्लाइटली एबो द अम्बिलिकल डिफेक्ट बिटवीन द अम्बिलिकल वेन एंड द सुपीरियर मार्जिन ऑफ द अम्बिलिकस इट्स एनाटोमिकली इट्स कॉल्ड पर अम्बिलिकल हनिया सर एनीथिंग फ्रॉम एनीथिंग मोर फ्रॉम हिस्ट्री और शुड आई सम मोर क्वेश्चन टू डिस्कस Uh, when you give diagnosis like this, yes. you should include EHS classification. Okay. So the diagnosis given, if you place the EHS classification, where does it fits in? Uh, sir, EHS classification. Uh, this is a primary ventral hernia. Yes. Sir. EHS classification is different for primary ventral hernia and incisional hernias. Yes. So this is what. Sir, uh, M two. Is M two? No, M three or M M three? M three. No, no. Is M three? Yes. Sir, M one is subsequent. M two is epigastric. M three is umbilical. Umbilical. Three centimeter below and above. So that is the line. Three centimeter above and below the umbilicus will be grouped as M three hernia. So this is M three hernia. Yes. And what about W? Sir, W, sir, it is W one. W one. Less than four centimeter. Yeah. So uh, you have to add this. Is it transmission? And when you describe the history, but you see in history, you describe the swelling. Number one, number two, you talked of constipation, cough, abdominal pain, yes. urinary complaint. Yes. These adult patients who comes with a parabolic hernia of recent onset, there are number of factors that comes up. Yes, one important factor is Strength. age, age, obesity, yes, and increased internal pressure. Yes, so you should. Ask little more question. If you, often you will find a patient, a elderly gentleman may have some uh, pathology in the abdomen, which causes increased internal pressure. That yes. means patient may have a lump in the abdomen, yes. which is increasing in size. He is not aware of that, but he presents with a hernia. Yes. This patient may have some symptoms, yes. which will suggest alteration of bowel habit. Yes. May suggest a underlying chronic carcinoma. Yes. So you have to specifically ask whether it's got any yes. history of a uh, straining at uh, stool, has any history of straining at micturition. So just saying uh, this, no urinary complaint is not enough. You have to specify clearly whether he has got any alteration in urinary frequency, any straining at micturition. Okay, so all these are important to find out any underlying cause for this patient. Okay, yes. and go to personal history. He said no history of addiction. How how smoking history is important in patient with heart hernia? So those who are chronic smokers may develop uh, COPD uh, and uh, and present with a chronic cough, and that will lead to increase the intra abdominal pressure and uh, and may the may the cause for uh, hernias. Patient is smoking still. Yes, sir. The day of admission. Would you advise him to stop smoking, or you continue your operation with the patient still having smoking? No, sir. I advise them to stop. Why? How how smoking is important in patient having hernia? You one you say this patient may have chronic cough, patient may have COPD. Apart from that, sir. Apart from that, sir, uh, smoking leads to. Uh, uh, weakness in the. How? How smoking can cause abdominal wall? The main point here is a hernia, which is going to be operated, 
and after the operation this is going to heal so smoking is a very important factor which can impair this healing process and patient may have recurrence there is high incidence of recurrence in smokers so how does smoking affects the annual outcome Sir, smoking, sir. Uh, sir, smoking. What is there in smoking which interferes with this uh, hernia outcome? Uh, sir, I'm the I'm the I'm smoke I'm contains nicotine. nicotine what sir. does nicotine do? Uh, sir, uh, nicotine is a vasoconstrictor. Yes, so if the patient is smoking is and in the wound site where you have sutured, there is vasoconstriction. What will happen? So there will be ischemia. Yes. There will be hypoxia. Less delivery of oxygen to the tissues. The nicotine causes platelet aggregation. Yes. It can form microthrombi in the wound environment. Okay. Yes. Nicotine impairs collagen maturation. Yes. So when the wound starts healing, initially type one collagen is late. Yes. And this type one collagen has to mature to type three collagen. The nicotine impairs this collagen maturation, so the wound strength will be impaired. The smoke contains carboxyhemoglobin. How so it harms? Sir, uh, carboxyhemoglobin has higher affinity towards the uh, oxygen so, binding capacity. So, so what so, happens in the tissue level? Uh, so the, hypo, uh, the tissue level, the perfusion will be decreased. So what happens to the oxy oxyhemoglobin curve? Uh, what happened to the dissociation curve? Shift to the right or left? Uh, it will shift to the. It will shift to the left. They are by meaning there will be less oxygen delivery to the healing tissue. So smoking is very important. You should keep in mind that smoking impairs wound healing, yes. and that can lead to failure of hernia repair. Okay, so they are you not end up history present illness by only one paragraph. History present illness in a patient hernia should. Particularly in elderly gentleman, in a congenital hernia, I am not bothered that he has got underlying internal malignancy. So, elderly gentleman, I am bothered whether he has got his secondary abdominal pathology, which may be the primary disease, and the manifestation is a paramedical hernia. Okay, yes. go to examination. You see, when you write local examination, I always emphasize what is that. I am not sure what you are examining. Suddenly, you start the inspection is D by three cell swelling. This is not only the examination of your swelling of the hernia. He has got a paramedical hernia, the swelling there. Here, the pathology in the abdomen. And as I said, he may not have any symptom. Patient having a large retroperitoneal tumor has no symptom. He's not aware of the lung. So here, local examination is examination of abdomen. Keep in mind, here is not only the swelling examination, it's a local examination dash examination of the abdomen. And then you already said that swelling get reduced or lying down. So the initial part of assessment should be made on standing so that the swelling is there in the full extent. So your comment should write examination of the abdomen. Initially, patient is examined on standing position and then patient is made to lie down. So first you assess the swelling on standing position and then ask him to lie down. And you have no point of the whole of abdominal examination. You just describe the swelling description. I'm not happy with that. So if you have a swelling in the umbilicus, the umbilicus may become asymmetric. Umbilicus may become stressed. You should comment about the shape of the abdomen. You should comment about the flanks. Okay, I mean the remaining part of it. Siddharth, am, right, am I right? Yes, sir. So, these are things you should examine. So, it's not only the swelling examination. So, examination of the abdomen, inspection, palpation, percussion. Come to percussion. Percussion in the abdomen. No, it's a separate heading. And, and again, you see, you written resonant note on percussion. Patient has got a three centimeter swelling, is not a big swelling. So, even if there is a gut, most of the time the country is omentum. Yes. So, it is difficult to appreciate percussion 
being resonant over a three centimeter swelling. It is not possible. So you comment on the percutaneous the rest of the abdomen. And then auscultation. These elderly gentlemen may have a rectal carcinoma, causing increasing constipation. So PR examination. You may write, not done, but that has to be there. Particle examination. And then come to system examination. Diagnosis. So, residual pyramidia in a 40-year-old gentleman, country intestine, without any comorbidities. By EHS classification, this is M3 W1. Sir, I would like to add something here. The yes. EHS classification for primary mental anemia and Incisional yes. anemia is different, actually. Yes, yes, different. Yes. Uh, in the, for primary ventral anemia, they are just mentioning now paraumbilical hernia and epigastric hernia in the midline. And spigelian. And lateral is spigelian and lumbar hernia. Yeah. This yeah. M1, M2, and M3 will come in uh, yeah, uh, incisional hernia. Yes, yes. M1, yes. M2, M3. Yes. Yes. By, if you go by location, if you go uh, by location. Is location this is a hernia, but this is a primary ventral hernia, where the parambolical is one. But the primary ventral hernia occurs in different sites. And the gap is measurement is different in initial and ventral hernias, primary ventral hernias. Okay, Siddharth, you can proceed. Yes, sir. So, uh, is what will be your differential diagnosis here? Differential diagnosis, sir. It's a swelling in the anterior abdominal wall. What are your differential diagnosis? So Can we have any cysts here? It's a lipoma. Why? Just examine your acts. You do not keep on saying things. You have assessed the patient clinically. The swelling history was like this. And yes, you say clinically it was reducible. Yes, so reducible, it cannot be anything other than hernia. Yes, your answer should be okay. gentle. So this patient has got a classic features of hernia. It was irreducible on history and also clinically I can reduce. If it is irreducible swelling from the beginning and on examination, then the other DD comes. Otherwise, you should not give a DD with lipoma or fibroma or rhabdomyoma here. What do you feel, Shidan? Yes, sir. That's what I was going for. If it is irreducible, then you will get other diagnosis like a, whether it is a, it can be a metastatic node or it can be a cyst of the vitello intestinal duct or urethra. <coughs> uh, if it was strangulated, what would I, what uh, which uh, presentation would have been different from how would have been how would it would have been deviated from the normal presentation? Sir, if it is uh, strangulated, sir, uh, patient. Uh, we present with uh, abdominal pains. Uh, Mind you, I am uh, telling strangulated, not obstruction. Okay. So, so patient may uh, present with uh, abdominal pain. How is the character of the pain in the strangulation, honey? How is the character of the pain in strangulated honey? Strangulated honey may be strangulated gut or strangulated momentum. The presentation will be a little different. Patient having strangulation of gut has more severe, severe symptoms. Yes. Strangulation of one patient has less severe symptoms. So, what is the characteristics of pain in a strangulated hernia? Yes, sir, if it is on symptoms, sir, uh, continuous dialogging pain. Yes, so it will be continuous dialogging pain. Yes. If it is a gut getting strangulated, initially the pain will be colicky. Yes, sir. When there is an obstruction and when the ischemia supervenes, the pain will become dull, constant, continuous. Okay, pain. What else? Yes, sir. And so, it will be irreducible. Yes, sir. Most important. Apart okay, from pain, how, what are that? Apart sir. from me, there may be some more symptoms. Sir. Apart from pain? Sir, apart uh, apart from pain, sir, vomiting. Yes. Uh, abdominal distension. Uh, patient may present constipation. And the, sir, uh, if patient is in shock, the yes. size a, of shock. If there is large annual content, patient is vomiting, patient may present with features of shock. Yes, sir. And on examination, what do you find? Sir, on examination, sir, uh, irreducible. Uh, features of shock? Features of shock, sir. Uh, Hypotension, tachycardia, and, and then local and examination? Sir, on local examination, sir, irreducible uh, swelling. Yes. Uh, 
temperature over the soaring are raised, uh, uh, signs of uh, uh, gangrene, uh, signs of. Gangrene, you can see it, right? What can happen? There may be discoloration of the old like skin. There may be discoloration of the old like skin. Okay, and it will be extremely tender. There may be rebound tenderness. Yes, tenderness and rebound tenderness will be the same. Okay, fine. Okay, what are the contents you expect here in a paramedical hernia? Sir, uh, in paramedical hernia, the most common is uh, sir, momentum. Other than that, sir, could be small intestine. Uh, sir, uh, urinary bladder. Paramedical hernia bladder is not a common content. Sir, bladder after small bladder, should be large guard. Transverse colon is an important one. Yes, sir. Okay. How would you proceed with the management of this patient? Sir, uh, I'll do the basic uh, investigation. Uh, okay. And then? So then, sir, uh, uh, USG whole abdomen to rule out any uh, other uh, intra-abdominal pathologies. Good. And to assess the defect size yes. also yes. to some extent. Yes. Okay. Okay, what so the, this, there is no... Role of CT scan? Role of CT scan for evaluation of ventral hernias? Uh, sir, uh, sir, we can assess the size of defect. We will do CT scan in all patients because there is a uh, some controversy here. The optimal workup for patient having ventral hernia. So will, for for small, this patient specifically, will you need the CT scan? No, sir. No. Then they are the hernia reducible, reducible, and you can feel the gap with your two centimeters. Yes. Sir. So for such defect, a male patient otherwise well preserved, he may not require CT scan. Yes. But some people still say I'll do a CT scan. Why? How, how, how CT scan scores over ultrasonography in evaluation of this abdominal wall? Abdominal wall anatomy is important for planning uh, ventral hernia repair. Yes. So if you do a CT scan, what do you look at in the abdominal wall? Sir, sir, I will uh, look for the you can first look at the hernia sac, Sorry. number one. Yes, sir. It's a you can look at the content. Yes, sir. Defects. And then you can exactly measure the defect cells. Yes. Apart from this, what else you can now see and uh, make a good assessment? Sir, we can see the anatomy of anterior Yes. So you can see the rectus muscle. Yes. You can see the flat muscles that are wall. Yes, so in some situations, particularly recurrent hernias or uh, redo hernias, you can find that abdominal muscle may be atrophic. Yes. Okay, so routinely it is not required, but patient having some uh, gross obesity, patient having repeated abdominal surgeries previously, this, this is a situation where CT scan may be required. But large defect, large defect, it should be a CT scan. Yes. Okay, in that case, you need to assess the abdominal flat muscles. So here, I don't think you need it. But yes. before you say baseline investigation, answer should be, I'll do ultrasonography of that. Ultrasound can be stored anywhere. Ultrasound is an extension of clinical examination that is being done by surgical resident in the ward itself. So, ultrasound, extrude other pathology in the abdomen and also helpful for evaluation of the hernial swelling. Yes, okay. Yes, that. Okay. Uh, so, what uh, treatment will you give to this patient? There is no inter abdominal pathology and the, it's a simple hernia, umbilical, parambilical hernia. So, what is the next treatment you will plan? Surgery you will plan? Sir, uh, in this uh, in this case, sir, the defect size is uh, small, uh, two centimeter. Sir, I'll go with anatomical repair. Sir. Anatomical repair. Okay. What is that? Uh, anatomical repair. What is anatomical repair? What you do in this patient? Sir, uh, we'll uh, do. Uh, we'll discuss uh, pros and cons and other options. What is anatomical yes. exactly repair? Sir. Uh, uh, sir, we'll give uh, trans, uh, elliptical incision around the umbilicus. Uh, the, around the umbilicus yes, means sir. you will excise the umbilicus. No, no. Sir. So why elliptical? Elliptical means you take a, a bridge of skin in that is elliptical. What is the incision? This half umbilical, transverse incision. Smiling. Smiling incision. Yes. Sir. Okay. Fine. Sir, uh, then. Uh, Sir, uh, we'll uh, dissect skin, uh, subcutaneous skin and uh, the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, 
will uh, then uh, the sac will uh, will be open from the neck and nee, will... dissect means what dissection is not the correct term once you what should the... be the first step it's not dissect what do you do so we will uh, in in inside the uh, subcutaneous tissue yes inside and then what so then we'll uh, dissect the what is it's not dissect what is what is this next step raising of raising skin flap skin that means around the hernial defect you will raise skin flap so you need to raise the upper skin flap and raise the lower skin flap now you have the hernia sag being seen in the midline What do you do now? So uh, we'll open the hernial sac. The What precaution you should take while you open the hernial sac? Sir, so, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, so we'll reduce the content. Try to reduce the content. Yes. Sometimes it is not reducible, but still you need to open up. What precaution you should take? Sir, so if uh, any additions are there, we should dice yes. first. Yes. And and. When you incise the hernial sac, you should take care that you don't injure the underlying cartilage. Okay, so you should lift, and then uh, uh, if you find the neck area is uh, very difficult to approach, you can open the sac and the fundus also. So opening up the hernial sac, and then tackling the contents. How do you tackle the contents? How do you do the contents? So uh, after opening, sir, we'll uh, reduce it. first yes you try to reduce it yes, if there is some additions the addition should be lysed and then return to the abdominal cavity yes, what next then you do anatomical repair so then uh, the sac uh, the sac uh, is uh, okay then you exercise the redundant sac yes, come sir, to the anatomical repair so how we do the anatomical repair What is the national process for repairing? What is the term used for the repair? The, sir, facial margin should be. Uh, okay, but no, not exactly. I'm just a position. There is some specific term. We will do a double breasting of the. Yes, sir. So, what is this process called? This surgery. What is it called? Name of the surgery. Sir, hernial abduction. No, it's Mayo's procedure. Okay, Mayo's method. No, Mayo's. See that Mayo's is different. If you say uh, Mayo cannot be called as anatomical repair. Anatomical repair is creation of the linear bar. There is a gap in the linear bar. You excise the hernial sac at the margin, and just oppose the margin with inter procedure. That is anatomical repair. Mayo's repair is one where you do a double breasting. but nowadays mayo repair is not being recommended and uh, is not being done at all because this mayo repair causes tension in the suture line yes. so anatomical repair is just a position of the midline with interrupted non absorbable sutures but there are some criticism of this anatomical repair okay in a patient who has got two centimeter gap again uh, people are opting more in favor of uh, mesh repair why mesh why mesh repair is still being recommended even for smaller hernias particularly a 48 year old gentleman he should be reviewing his uh, profession whether he is a manual laborer he need to lift weight or uh, his uh, job involves uh, uh, some strenuous activities so in that case in anatomical repair the chance of recurrence is higher to the tune of 10 to 20% yes so in that case even if some patient with smaller defect also people recommend putting a mesh you decided to put a mesh how you place it what are the different ways of placing mesh in uh, paramelic hernias so preperitoneal this can be done by open technique or be done by lap technique divide it yes. if you are talking of Mesh repair you have done by laparoscopically or you have done by open technique. You are thinking of doing open technique of mesh placement. So what is that? So uh, preperitoneal mesh uh, replacement. Finally, easy to talk about, Corona. More, 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 and more people will do a simple method. 
you do a anatomical closer and then place the mesh where above the repair that means deep to the skin so you paid to put a mesh in the subcutaneous plane what is that mesh placement called as this technique of placing mesh is known as what only this is only mesh placement only means you oppose the gap and place a mesh over that to, to reinforce the repair what should be the minimum overlap on each side 4 cm yes you should do at least 4 to 5 overlap on all sides okay because mesh can contract this is only next ियम इट कैन बी Pre peritoneal, yes. it can be retrorectus. Yes. Sir. What is inlay mesh placement? Sir, inlay sir, in between the rectus was within a defect. In inlay means the defect, defect is large. Is large. You cannot bring the defect in the midline. So you are bridging the defect with inlay mesh. What is the criticism for inlay mesh placement? What is the criticism for inlay mesh placement? Do you think a mesh will take the strength of abdominal wall? No. So with large defect, you can temporarily come out by putting a mesh like this, but this is not a good technique of repair because there is high chance of recurrence. So how how is this inlay being now replaced by newer technique? You cannot bring the gap in the midline. Large gap. So instead of inlay, what is the next alternative? Sir, component separation. Yes, component separation. So you can dissect either the posterior component area or anterior component, area and release the transverse abdominis, bring the defect in the midline. Okay. Yes, uh, Shita, you can have some discussion on laparoscopic repair. Yes, sir. Uh, what are the methods of laparoscopic approach for this patient? स्पेशल अबाउट दिस मेस फिस्ट Okay, so momentary addition, bowel additions, uh, fistula formation. So proline is not a good mesh for interpretive purpose. What does a dual mesh contains? Dual means there must be two layers. What are the two layers? Uh, Intraperitoneally, sir, towards the abdomen, sir. Uh, that is smooth or rough? Sir, towards smooth. the viscera. Yes, sir. That is smooth. What? And what, what is, is this chemical metal? layer? Sir, PTFE. PTFE, nee. Ah. That is oxidized cellulose. Oxidized cellulose. And the basic material in the mesh is a combination of polypropylene and polyglactin. So the deeper layer is smooth, which causes least tension in the abdominal viscera, and the upper layer is a mix of polypropylene and. 
Okay. Then how do you fix the mesh? Sir, uh, first, sir, uh, sir, Labrois ko fix it. How? Yeah, Labrois ko fix it. How will you fix the mesh to the abdominal wall? Sir, uh, the, sir, the edges of the mesh uh, uh, is after putting the mesh inside the entire abdominal wall. What are the two things you will use to fix? Come to that. Yes, you say you edges, mean? some sutures are there, na? Yes, sir. What are the sutures? We pull, we pull the suture out and tie. Sir, prefix sutures are there. Uh, so, uh, what is this edge. suture called as? If you now tie the suture, what is this suture called as? These are? These are transfacial sutures. Trans sutures. Okay. Yes, so, sir. you have pre-tied uh, thread. You put inside and bring this thread out on corners. Yes. And then tie. These are transfacial sutures. What is the problem with transversal sutures? Transversal suture may cause pain. The transfer that is coming up, that people say that <coughs> it can strangle nerves and there is more incidence of pain with transversal sutures. So people who are conversing with suturing, they just keep uh, put sutures uh, interpreted in it. And then the remaining part of the mesh is fixed by uh, sir, tackers. 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 What is the newer uh, laparoscopy technique for uh, this uh, alternative to the IPOM? People are coming up. A lot of publications has come. Is that? Have you heard of E-tape repair? Yes. E-tape. Not heard. What is E-tape? What it is tape? What is tape? Sir, trans and uh, total. Uh, total? Extraperitoneal. Total uh, extraperitoneal repair. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that is done in groin hernias. Yes. Sir. Now a new term has come with E tape. That is described as extended tape or enhanced view tape. Yes. So here you make a very wide area of dissection in the, in the retroactor space. You start on one side and then pass over to the other side. So you create a large area of retroactor space dissection, then dissect the hernia sac. Now you have a defect where defect in the posterior sheet, defect in the anterior sheet. Okay. So you repair the defect in the posterior sheet, repair the defect in the anterior sheet. And then place a mesh. You have to place a, you have made a very large area. You have yes. to place a very large mesh. Okay. Yes. For perambolic hernia, people have come up with a very simple laparoscopic procedure. What is that? A simple, but again, an extensive dissection. What is that? Have you heard of Scola? What is that? What is Kola? Huh? Subcutaneous? This is a... You have a parameter hernia. What you do is you take a excess in the subcutaneous patient the abdominal wall. And insufflate. Keep on dissecting this saponous tissue. Yes, You'll find the hernia in the midline. Yes, Dissect the hernia sac. Reduce it. And put a large sheet of mesh covering this whole disease area. The problem with this is this is a operation where you're not going to the peritoneal cavity. It is a subcutaneous dissection. But for a small hernia, it is a very large space. The chance of serum formation is more. What is uh, uh, TAPP repair for winter hernia? TAPP. And how to do that? People are doing transabdominal pre preparatory repair for winter hernia. What is that? You have a ventral hernia. That means in the umbilicus, there is a pouch going outward. Yes, sir. So what do you do? Sir, uh, 
will reduce the content. Huh? No, no. The the approach is what? Trans abdominal or extra abdominal? Is it trans abdominal trans approach? So you make force, and then what you do is you have to raise a flap. Flap. flap of, uh, you raise a peritoneal flap with a posterior rectus sheath above the hernia defect and dissect below. Dissect the hernia sac. Now, once you have dissect, you have dissect the retrorectal space. Yes. And this posterior sheath is down. The advantage of this technique is instead of a dual mesh which costs you 30 40,000 rupees, you can use simple polypropylene mesh. So, a closer defect in the anterior sheet, place the proline mesh, fix it, and then switch at the pattern flap. This is TAPP repair. So, there any other question? You can pass on the next case. No, sir, we'll go to the next case. My patient, uh, one point five year, uh, one and a half year male child, resident of Hollywood, respondent's mother, uh, with came with a chief complaint of swelling in the left groin and scrotum since birth. Pure present illness, as per mother, swelling in the left groin of child was noticeable since birth, which you, uh, used to get prominent whenever the child used to cry. The swelling initially was at the groin, which uh, gradually size of approximately 3 cm at present, <laughs> extending up to scrotum. The swelling increases when the child sits, cries and strains and reduces in size slowly as a uh, child lies down. No history of pain over the swelling, no history of irreducibility of swelling, no history of pain, vomiting, abdominal distension and uh, absolute cons constipation. Uh, no history of chronic or difficulty in passing urine. History of past illness, uh, no history of any previous operative intervention, no history of medical ailment, birth history, antenatal history, maternal age was uh, 26, no history of OCP uses, perinatal history, birth order 1 term delivered by uh, cesarean section, birth weight 2.5 kg approximately, exclusively on breastfeed. Postnatal history, nothing significant, immunization, all immunization received as per schedule. Personal history, diet, veg diet, sleep pattern, appetite normal, bowel habit normal, bladder habit normal. Family history, both parents are healthy, single child, no other member in the family suffers from this condition. Summary, one and a half year old male child present with, uh, presents with a gradually increasing pain swelling in the left groin extending to scrotum, which decreases its size on lying down and become more prominent when the child stands like crying and coughing. No signs of irreducibility and uh, Strangulation, the uh, uh, child has no history of previous operation, chronic cough and insulation difficulties. Uh, uh, Nitesh, if, um, in history, the child won't say that the pain is radiating to scrotum. Pain is in left groin, that can be indicated when he's crying or there's tenderness. But radiating to scrotum, I don't think the child can explain. On no, this statement is not required. Okay. Okay. So examinations are within the uh, normal, uh, are essentially normal, sir. Uh, inspection. Uh, and local examination of both groin. Because he comes out swelling in one side, then he's swelling the other side also. So local examination of both the groin and inguinoscotal region. Or you can make a point of inguinoscotal region. Yes, uh, swelling of approximately 6 into 3 cm on the left inguinal region extending up to the end of the scrotum starting from the point just above the midpoint of inguinal crease. Swelling was piriform in shape. Uh, swelling was increasing in uh, size on swelling. No uh, swelling on the uh, contralateral side seen. On palpation, uh, swelling present on the left inguinal region extending up to the end of the scrotum starting from the point just above almost the mid part of the inguinal crease. Size is uh, 7 to 2 cm medial to pivotal. Pyriform in shape, soft on palpation, 
uh, swelling was increasing in uh, size and strain strain straining temperature over the swelling is comparable with other part of the abdomen get up of the swelling was not possible expansile cuff impulse was present on the swelling swelling was reducible no deep tendon is noted both the testes were normal in position shape percussion percussion over the swelling had a resonant note auscultation over the swelling uh, bowel sound systemic examination uh, is essentially normal summary a 2 year old male child present with uh, gradually increasing painless swelling in the left when extending to scrotum which decreases in size on lying down and become more prominent when the child strains like crying and gulping no signs of irreducibility in strangulation the child has no history of previous operation chronic of maturation difficulties on examination the pariform shaped swelling of 7 and uh, 3 uh, 2 cm extending up to the scrotum in the left inguinal region was noted medial to pubic tubercle which had a cuff impulse on palpation and increases in size on straining no signs of complication at present diagnosis left sided and complicated congenital hernia in 1 and 1/2 year old child continues in this okay Uh, you have not mentioned any examination of genitalia, external genitalia, testes. The testes, sir. Uh, both the testes are present. Sir. Uh, and you have not also not mentioned whether the swelling is palpable separately from the testes or not. I don't think you have mentioned that. Go back to the examination. And definitely the other side examination is missing. right sided examination see if the when the patient comes with oh, a congenital hernia on one side there is a high possibility that there might be a hernia on the other side also yes 10% chances the hernia is bilateral in 10% yes. of cases okay so anything else sir uh, so if if the swelling is going to the bottom of the scrotum in a patient congenital hernia do you think the testes and the swelling will be uh, separate or uh, it will difficult to palpate the testes the swelling being present there uh, so difficult to palpate. difficult because in congenital hernia the whole process is very spread yes sir the swelling comes down and comes all around the testes okay suppose this this often happens that patient comes to the opd and you examine the patient you find nothing no swelling Yes. So will you discard this patient that he has no hernia, or you rely on something else? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, we are getting history of uh, swelling, uh, and on. Uh, no, that's what the uh, mother is complaining that the patient is having a swelling. Sir, will what uh, will you do? You are not getting a swelling clinically. What will you do next? Sir, will go with uh, USG in one or two days. No, even USG may be normal because that point the hernia is reduced. the hernia history is very important history in pediatric hernias if the mother definitely says that the swelling comes up on straining on crying and then uh, is uh, uh, sitting that history is very important one examination in the opd you may not be able to see the swelling but that mother is saying that the swelling is present and this comes up on straining you have to keep in mind that this might be her okay so yes. often this can happen that you cannot appreciate the swelling on a casual first examination okay so so uh, what are your differential diagnosis first okay. differential diagnosis that should come to your mind again don't go for percussion in a in a uh, patient uh, hernia with this small swelling like this going it is difficult to appreciate the uh, percussion note it's not possible there are other ways to appreciate the content what is the differential diagnosis you said the hernia any other diagnosis so, uh, here there is a dd you said congenital hernia there is another diagnosis close to this that is congenital hydrosis 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 Congenital so hydrosis. How will you? What is the difference between the two? I mean, anatomically speaking, what is the difference between a congenital hernia and a congenital hydrosis? Sir, uh, 
एनाटोमिकली सर द सोइलिंग एंड द हाइड्रोसिल द सी बोथ ऑफ देम आर पैटर्न प्रोसेसेस वे जनरलिस बोथ आर एनाटोमिकली द सैक इज सेम सर गेट अ गेट अप ऑफ द सोइल नहीं बोथ गेट टू द सोइलिंग प्रोसेस कॉन्जेंटल हाइड्रोजन एंड कॉन्जेंटल हाइड्रोसिल द होल पैटर्न प्रोसेस वे जनरलिस देयर the only difference is if the content is fluid it become conjugate hydrosyl if the content is omentum or cut it becomes a hernia how can you differentiate this any clinical test transilomerase yes transformation there is something called as a silk glove sign yes have you heard of it see the hernia uh, pechen processes vaginalis is very thin so when you palpate around the cord the two layers of the processes vaginalis or the sac slip on your finger finger like there are the layers of silk when you when i rub two pieces of silk cloth okay the feeling will be similar Which side do you expect the hernia? This is the left side of hernia, but on which side do you expect the hernia more? Chances of congenital hernia is more on which side? The right side. Sir. Right. Side. Reason? Sir, uh, late, uh, late descent of uh, process of congenital. Hmm. On right side, no. It's not process. Yes. But descent of what? Uh, yes. Okay. Should we go to investigation, sir? Yes, yes. How do you manage? Uh, How do you manage? One and a half year child came to you. Uh. Uh, sir, uh, sir, basic investigation to be done for fitness. Okay, okay. next. Uh, sir, uh, ultrasounds. Uh, What are the things you will see in ultrasound? <laughs> Sir, what are the things you will see in ultrasound? Treatment for congenital hernia and hypoxia are same. Okay. Yes, sir. But you need to diagnose. So, can uh, ultrasound give a diagnosis? Yes, why not? Yes. Ultrasound can see the clear fluid in the hernia sac. <coughs> ultrasound can make out there is some. <coughs> Other content in the hernia sac. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then ultrasound also will exclude some urinary pathology. <clears throat> This patient may have straining because of some uh, congenital urinary tract problems, postural valve causing uh, <coughs> bladder distension. May have high urinary tract, high urinary tract changes. Yes. So ultrasound also should be included in the abdomen. How will you manage? So basically, you will see both the sides of inguinal portal region and postpoid residual urine. These are the things you should see in ultrasound. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sir. So what is the surgery? Sir. You will plan. Sir, hernia. Tonic. Will you operate any patient coming with the history of, with the history of hernia, even if you cannot see it clinically? Sir. Will you operate any patient? Who is coming with the history? Mother is complaining of hernia, swelling, and uh, you cannot assess it clinically. You cannot find the hernia clinically. Will you proceed for surgery? Yes. No. Usually, if the hernia is reduced, uh, there is at that point you should not do. At least uh, if it is not present on sonogram. Okay. So you should document it. What what surgery will do? Sir, what is that? Uh, uh, so we'll uh, give uh, transversal incision in the groin. Uh, uh, below the deep internal inguinal vein. No, no. If you incise the skin, so when you see, you get that extremely open orifice. Yes, sir. Or show me the ring. Yes, sir. One and half year child. What do you do next? Sir. Uh, Then, sir, uh, external uh, oblique abdominis uh, should be in size. Yes. Then, in one half, if you are doing at birth, you may not need to open the inguinal canal. Yes, sir. You just do the section of the region of sovation ring because 
so we shall deep ring are close to close each other. to each other but one and a half year child there is some uh, length formation of inguinal canal so need to open the external gap neurosis yes okay yes. what precaution you should take while you dissect the hernia sac what precaution you should take when you dissect a hernia sac in a pediatric patient is there any specific structure that you should not touch first of all is the hernia sac is very thin yes is a very thin hernia sac if i not cautious you can open the hernia sac number 1 number 2 you should be very cautious not to touch the pus mass and the testicular vessels your idea is to dissect the hernia sac away from this structures like in adult you dissect the uh, you can hold the vas you can hold the uh, container split off on your finger it's not advisable you have to dissect nicely the hernia sac which is very thin sac yes sir and dissect up to the uh, up to the sir region of deep ring yes sir and what to do next yes, sir after uh, uh, isolate uh, is it possible to take the fundus of the sac out in the inguinal canal no sir is a congenital hernia sac yes sir complete procedure very less yes sir don't attempt to bring the fundus of the sac to the groin yes sir so you dissect in the groin yes sir divide and then transect the keep the distal cut end open yes sir and the proximal cut end is dissected up and then you transfix transfix the send in the deep in yes transfix the neck of the hernia sac yes sir and excise the redundant sac yes sir okay yes, sir. and then you close the so, close the sac uh, Uh, the distal uh, sac is closed uh, along with uh, the cord. Any 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 laparoscopic technique for this repair? And any advantage about the open repair? What is the laparoscopic technique for management of congenital hernia? Uh, Here you said there is no defect in the inguinal canal. The idea is to Take okay. the hernia sac. Yes, sir. So what do you do? Initially, when the laparoscopy started, people were just putting a pursing suture in the region of deep ring. Yes. The so, problem is, if you just apply pursing suture, the distal sac is persistent. There is risk of development of hydrosis. So what they do now is, you make an incision in the peritoneum around the deep ring. So distal cut end is left open. and the proximal cut in towards the peritoneal cavity you just apply pursing suture close the deep ring yes. that is the laparoscopy repair what is the advantage of laparoscopy repair over the open advantage is again again it is it is less painful yes sir is less painful and you can do it 3 mm instrument yes sir and and most important is you can diagnose the contralateral Yes, sir. in open you need to explore. Yes, sir. if you don't find, you just only need to explore. Okay, so in in laparoscopy, the advantage you can see the opposite ring area. At birth, at birth there is higher incidence of peritoneal prostate bleeds. Does all these patients need operation on the other side? No, sir. No. Previously, we used to do routine uh, bilateral inguinal exploration. But you observe that only ten percent of these patients may develop. So a routine bilateral hernia-tomy is not indicated. Yes, Shridhar. Will you operate all the cases of hernia or not? Any patient of congenital hernia will you operate or not? Yes, sir. Yes. Why? Yes, sir. 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 and one more thing how is the cord related to sac when you are approaching in a open method how is the what is the relation of cord with the uh, sac with the cord sir uh, after, during uh, why 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 opening yes. what is the relation between the cord and the sac where is the cord where is the sac sir uh, sac sir uh, sac is lateral Lateral is anterior and 
sac is anterior lateral to the cortex. So if you take this structure, the first thing to come is a sac. And sac is on the more lateral side of the cord, is anterior lateral to the cord. Can you do this on a daycare basis? Congenital hernia, sure. Can we do it this on a daycare basis? Yes, we can do. Simple unilateral congenital hernia, we can plan on a daycare basis. Most, most of these are done on a daycare basis. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, someone has asked, how did you examine the expansion impulse? You see, expansion impulse uh, may be an inspiratory finding. <coughs> when the hernia is reduced, you ask the patient to a uh, cuff or if the child is crying, you can appreciate the swelling is getting bigger. Yes. That is the expansion of the cuff. Or you can appreciate by palpation. You keep your finger slightly pressed and as the child cries, you can feel that the impulse is coming to your finger. So, the palpable expansion is on impulse and cuff. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Siddharth. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir.